have any any questions on the, on the first summer. Um, um, so if you haven't looked at it, um, keep in mind it's it's due next week on Wednesday at the start of class. So when you come in before the class starts, you need to hand them the end. If they're not turned in when class starts, um, um, then they're late. Um, so, um, so if you still have questions, um, Yen's office hours I, are on uh, Monday in the, in the morning from 10 until noon. Um, and I think the details are on the webpage, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then my office hours are tomorrow morning uh, from 11 till noon. Uh, if there are other questions, you can email or post them on the group and, and we'll try and answer them. Um, one common point of confusion is that if you want to draw a cumulative density plot, um, so, so what it, you're, you're going to have is some, um, some sort of value, and then you're going to have the, um, the, um, the probability that um, some random variable is less than this, less than this value. And so the cumulative density plot should always be increasing. Um, is, yeah, is, is less than this value because uh, if it's if, if the value gets larger, then it's always you know the probability is always um, you have, you have more possible events which can take place, right? So this goes from zero to one, and this goes over the thing of the value. So you have to do this a couple of times. So. Um, the cumulative, so the, the alternative to doing cumulative density plots is trying to say plot the actual probability of this value. So if you have um, discrete events, right? So the value can only take a discrete number of things. You can make like a histogram, and this is okay. But sometimes you have a continuous set of values, and then trying to plot the probability of an individual value is well, it's not clear what that means, right? If, if, if you say, I have a random variable between 0 and 1, what's the probability it's 0.7? Zero. Um, yeah, so it's with probability 0, actually, yeah. So, uh, so everything would be 0, but that doesn't tell you anything, right? So people will typically do something like a histogram, but histograms have issues with boundaries. You can do something like a, um, like a kernel density estimate is usually what uh, statisticians would do. And you can ask Yann about doing those at really big scale if you want to, I'm sure, in our office hours. And she should be happy to tell you about them, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, so uh, the, um, but if you, if you do a cumulative density plot, then you don't have any of these issues. Um, because you can, you can define exactly what is the probability that this event is less than this value and it captures all the information, and there's no kind of uh, confusion about event, something having an event at, uh, having an event that has probably zero of happening, but is still significant over a range, or these boundary issues or something. So that's why I ask you to plot this, the, uh, plot your data in this way. Um, okay. Uh, So let's see. So today we're going to talk about um, the Jacquard um, similarity and uh, shingling. And so one of the things I I talked about in the first lecture where I gave the overview of what we're doing in the class, one of the themes was going to be converting from some sort of data um, that's kind of data in the raw into some abstract representation. And this abstract representation is something that we know how to deal with and we, we can process in, in uh, um, some way efficiently. We can develop general techniques that work on this abstract representation. And so then the goal is from lots of raw data types, we want to translate them into something more abstract that we know how to deal with. Um, and so this process is often um, pretty messy. There are lots of choices you have to make, and these are modeling choices. And 
there's not always a clear right answer or there's not always a clear wrong answer, right? But um, these choices have effects on your data and it's good to be mindful of these. And so um, what we'll talk about today is kind of a very, um, a very useful and common technique for translating text into some abstract data types. And so we'll go from text into sets um, today. And then the chart similarly will be talking about how to measure the similarity and the distance between sets. Um, and then later we'll convert the sets into these high dimensional vectors and then we can compare those as well. We'll look at other, another abstract type is, um, is going to be a matrix, right? So let me just write this down, raw data. Um, to some sort of abstract um, representation. And examples of these are um, sets, um, vectors, and um, matrices. So sets have the least structure. Um, vectors have have more structure and are easy to work with. Matrices have a lot of structure, but they have they usually have too much structure for a lot of the data that, uh, uh, that we'll be looking at. So we'll we'll more think about the matrices uh, than actually use them. Sometimes we'll use them, but we'll immediately try and not have to use them because they they're they're they're, they're they can be easy to work with, but very slow to work with. And and we'll we'll see that in in future lectures. Um, so, so and today we'll be talking about the type of abstract data of, of text. Um, and so a lot of data out there that you can easily get on the internet, and this has just proliferated like crazy in the last 10 years, is, is in the form of text. Right? If you have if you have web pages, they're you know they're HTML, but really what you see, you can think of it as just the text on the screen, all the well, the strings of words and spaces and so forth, you know. If you have blog posts, if you have emails, these are all text. Even messages on Twitter is, is text, right? How do you how do you understand that? How do you convert that into something that's uh, that you can actually work with? So, like, if um, so, one thing, and this is you know something you do at the start class is one option. One type of text is um, um, homework assignments. Um, so let's, everyone in this class next week will turn in a homework assignment and let's say I wanted to detect if you were um, trying to, if, if people were, if people's solutions were too similar, right? How do I check how similar are these, these homework assignments? The stuff we'll talk about is not necessarily the state of the art, but it's what a lot of these techniques are based on. Um, so so th there, there, are, there are, in case you're not aware, there is software out there that you can feed a bunch of homework assignments and they can see if some look too similar. So, um, not saying anything, just a reminder. But, uh, but I'm, yeah. So, um, uh, um, another one that's important is like um, web pages. So, if Google's building this index of all the web, right, and you search, um, and there are these, you, if you, this happens a lot if you search for like a recipe. Right, I'm thinks every Thanksgiving I search for the recipe for um, how to cook a turkey, right? And because that's something you only do once a year, so you forget. And you look, and a lot of the recipes look pretty similar. And um, and and so actually, there are a lot of web pages out there that duplicate the same recipe, hoping to get hits, hoping to get advertisements. You know, that's a really valuable time to get advertisements right before Black Friday when there's lots of shopping. So you can place really good ads on that page if you get lots of hits. And so there are lots of rep pages with the same, basically the same content, almost the same HTML on the page. How do you tell if these are similar? If, to Google's advantage, it's to their advantage if they only put one, um, one uh, you know, each link is a, is, a, is a distinct recipe, right? So you can go and look at several of them and compare them. But if all the top ten all tell you exactly the same instructions, that's not, not going to be useful. So, so web pages, you don't want, you want to detect if they're similar web pages or if they're, if they're duplicates. 
Yeah. Don't they look at number of incoming links and number of outgoing links on a given page and then get a ratio and rank it based on that? So, uh, so we'll talk about that later. So that's um, the page rank algorithm, right? So this is this is how they tell how important a a certain web page is. Yeah. Right. That's publish their page rank, which is same on how Facebook stories get published to priority. Yeah, yeah, but that's not telling you they can. You can have two, and we'll actually talk about how you can design a whole set of web pages to try and fool page rank, right? And then yeah. how page rank can try and beat the system, right? But this is telling you how important it is. Not you could have two things that both look very important, but they're really telling you the same thing. They're duplicates. Two companies. There's about.com and maybe recipes.com. They're both trying to give you the same, you know, basic recipe. And there's no point in having both of them up there. So you want to not, you know, display both of those in your in your ranking of publics. Yeah. Um, would would this be applicable with like hospital systems too, where they kind of traverse all the patient data and their electronical medical records and try to determine if a patient has a, an illness before they even know it? So if you're looking through data and trying to look for patterns associated with an illness, so th th that's probably a slightly different problem. There, there are certain, so th there are parts of understanding text that trying to understand the meaning of the doctor's notes. This is a really, really challenging problem as it turns out. Doctors are not good at taking notes and it's better than if they wrote it by hand, but, but not much better. And uh, so understanding what that means is, 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 is one challenge, um, but, but more what you do there is trying to develop rules of these symptoms leads can be indicator of this. And we're more gonna be trying to say two documents, are they similar to each other? So, so th th that's kind of a more advanced problem and we'll, we'll maybe get to some things, some things related to, to that in the, in the future. It's hard to, I don't know if we'll cover that exactly, but maybe I'll, I'll think about spots to, to, put, to put that topic in. Um, the third example um, is email. Why would you want to tell if two emails look very similar to each other? Yeah, spam, right? Um, um, spam detection. Um, and this is, this is a core part of um, spam detection. They're trying to a lot of spam looks very similar. There's, there's this ongoing battle between spammers and spam blockers, right? And, and one of the things they do is trying to detect spam, and the spammer's trying to encode the spam to look to get past the detection. And if a lot of the messages are very similar to each other, and then the spammers start to add in certain types of typos to try and fool the algorithms. I don't know if you know this. At one point, spam all of a sudden got really bad and lots of typos in it. And it was because they were fooling algorithms like the ones that we'll be, we'll be talking about. Um, so, so spammers have found a way, way around this, but they had to, like spammers are actually doing lots of kind of interesting stuff in figuring this out, right? So they then, you know, Google had to come up with better algorithms to detect the spam, and there's other monetary <laughs> ways they can go about it as well, which are turning out to be pretty effective. I don't know if my spam has gone down a lot the last couple of years. I don't know the rest of you, but maybe I just got lucky. Yahoo then everything spam, but otherwise. Oh yeah, is Yahoo still bad? Uh, uh, i got a friend who's going to start working at Yahoo soon. But I, I guess that's his problem now. Uh, right, so now the question is we have this, this document and the question we want to ask is, um, how um, do we uh, um, compare? So given, given two email messages, how do we say how similar these email messages are? So, well, okay, so, so I've, I've given this, this, this fairly abstract question, but I haven't, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure we get the, fundamental straight. I haven't even defined what a distance is or and we're not actually going to use a distance, we're going to use a similarity, right? So a, a distance is, is going to be a, um, a function d that's going to go between two sets and, and it's going to output some um, number. 
So you could think of this as like a function that takes in two arguments, A and B, and these can be two, two documents, and it's, it's going to output some value, so this distance is going to be in 0 to um, uh, um, in between 0 and infinity, right? So it's going to take in two documents, and basically the property is that, um, so it's, it's usually you want the value to be 0 if A equals B, if they're the same, and you want to be large, and I'll, you know, large is a relative term if A and, and B are um, different. And, and you want it to kind of, as they become more similar, as they become more, uh, more equal to, closer to being equal to each other, you want the distance to get small, right? So th this is kind of the notion of distance. You're probably, um, you know, familiar with this. Um, but we're going to be working with something which is similar to a distance, well, um, um, which is kind of like a distance, but it's kind of like the dual of it. Uh, 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 called a, uh, this is called similarity, and again, it maps between um, two things. Uh, usually, we're going to have it go between zero and one instead of between um, zero and, and infinity instead. So it's it's still going to be some you know, think of two documents and the output is going to be between 0 and 1, but the difference is that it's going to be 1 if, if um, A equals B, and it's going to be small if um, A and B are uh, um, if A and B are different. Now, transition in a similar way. So, um, so often, if you have a similarity, you can translate into a distance. Um, so, this, so one way of doing this is to say that um, D of A and B equals one minus um, the similarity A and B. And this works if the distance is between zero and one. If the distance is infinity, then this isn't going to make sense, right? Do our distances have to satisfy a triangle inequality? Uh, they don't have to. So if a distance satisfies a triangle inequality, it's zero if they're equal to each other, and you can reverse the terms and it's, and it's the same value, then you call the metric. That's a special class of distances. And we'll talk about those and different types of metrics um, in, uh, in, a, in a few lectures. Um, so, but right now I'm just saying this is a general distance. And there are some very useful distances which don't satisfy the triangle they call. Um, so you don't always want to do that. Um, so, so often you can say this uh, more, and for what? So if you, if, I guess if the similarity is between 0 and 1, then, then this always works to a distance, but its range is now between 0 and 1 instead of otherwise. You can, you can do something a bit more more general, um, where you can say something like uh, d a a plus d b b minus two d um, coefficient similarity similarity between a and b. So. If you do this, this is a bit. This this works in other cases. There there are different ways to translate between a distance and a similarity. Um, so if if it's confusing, just just you can just think about this one. So we're going to be talking about comparing documents with the similarity, which will be easier to work with in this context, and it'll be easier to, to say formal formal things about. Um, and other times it'll be easier to think about a distance. Um, but, and, but, you know, there's often an easy way to translate back and forth between them, but it's, it's good to understand what, what, the, what the difference between them is. Um, okay, and so the particular 
um, similarity we will we'll talk about is going to be the um, jacquard um, similarity. And this is going to be between two sets, right? So a set is going to be a class of objects. So I've got an example I'm going to. And some other set, which may be one, two, three, five, six, seven, nine. Right? Um, okay, so when you write with the curly brackets, this indicates it's a set, and the objects are separated by, by commas. A set does not care about the order, it just cares about which objects are contained. So, you know, the set of 0 and 1 is the same as the set of 1 and 0, right? So, <coughs> 0, 1 is equal to 1, 0. These two are the same in set notation. Yeah. Are the properties of the set unique? Can we have two zeros or? So, uh, yeah, in, in general you can have two, you can have two zeros. That might be called a multi-set. Um, sometimes you have counts of, you just keep counts of different items as a way of thinking about it as a data structure problem instead of actually maintaining the separate ones. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking today, but sometimes you say you can't have, uh, have multiples. And so the sets we'll be talking about today, just to keep it simpler, if you're going to combine two sets and they both have an item, you only keep one of them. So you just keep the, the objects which are in and not, and not worry about the multi set. Okay, so, so then we want to come up with the similarity um, between these two sets. How similar are these two sets to each other? Right, and so the, um, um, the Jacquard similarity between two sets is defined as um, A cap B over A union B. So this cap means this is, is the intersection and this is the union. <coughs> so if you were to write this in, in LaTeX, uh, you write it cap and this one as uh, slash cup. If you use LaTeX enough, you just kind of just remember these things. Um, um, so, so, so the, the intersection between these two sets, I'll just go through this example. Um, the intersection is then also going to be a set. There's going to be 0, 2, 5. These are the elements which are in, in both of the sets. Right? That's the intersection. And then the, the union are all, of, are all of the elements. And here I don't count them twice, but they appear twice. Uh, So the union is just all the elements. And so then when I put these bars around the outside, this is called the cardinality of a set. It counts how many elements are in the set. Right? So then this has, has three. There are three elements in the, in the intersection. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements in the, in the, in the union. And so the Jacquard similarity is three eighths. So, um, so uh, we should be able to verify that this satisfies the property of the similarity that I've, um, that I've said here, right? So um, if the sets are the same, um, well, so uh, um, this property is almost always true. That if A and B are the same, this will, <coughs> is this always going to be 1? If they're the same elements, the intersection and the union is going to be the same thing. There's a special case you have to worry about. If, if they're both empty, then you have the cardinality of 0 over 0, which is undefined. But let's define that as 1. Okay? Uh, but we can define, so there's a special case for Jacquard where they're both empty, then it's, it's one. Um, so, um, 
But, but otherwise, if they're the same, it's equal to 1, okay? And will it always be between 0 and 1? Can it, it can't ever be less than 0 because this is a count, right? The count can be 0 divided by something. So if there's nothing negative, so it's between 0 and 1. Because this number, the intersection can never be larger than the union. So that means it has to be between 0 and 1, so it satisfies these properties. Right, so that's, that's good. Um, and, and so it'll smoothly you know, transition between them. If I added element um, 4 into here, well, 4 was not in here, so they become more, more different than each other. Right, because there's another element in here which was not in here. So the, the Descartes similarity will go down. The intersection would still be 3, but the union would then be 9, so it gets smaller. If I added 3 to this set, then they have another element in common without this set of elements increasing, right? So then the intersection becomes 4, and the union becomes still 8. So they're, they're still, so that then the similarity increases, right? So this, this seems to make sense as a, as a distance. And this is, this is probably, you know, the most commonly used similarity between sets. There are, there are other similarities, but this is probably the most commonly used one. Um, so, um, there's a, there's a small variation on this all, um, I'll mention as well. Um, so you can do um, sometimes it's useful to have the Jacquard similarity with clustering, <coughs> and and I'll I'll get back to documents and explain why why this could be useful. Um, but the idea is that you can have these clusters or uh, of of possible elements in um, uh, um, cluster of elements um, that, that are in the domain of all elements, right? So you can have cluster 1 equals 0, 1, 2. Cluster 2 equals 3, 4. Cluster 3 is equal to uh, 5, 6. Cluster 4 is equal to 7, 8, 9. Okay. And then instead of, <coughs> you can have the Jacquard similarity with clustering, where instead of counting the, the, the actual elements, you count how many different clusters are, are present in the set. Um, so then you would, you would say that um, in this example, a cluster uh, is it is going to have elements from from cluster one and from cluster three, and B cluster is going to have elements from cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, and cluster four, and 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 then the Jacquard similarity cluster of A B is 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 equal to the Jacquard um, similarity of A cluster, um, B cluster, which is equal to, uh, let's see, in, in this case, the intersection is going to be, it's going to be C1, C3, because C1 and C3 are in both A cluster and B cluster, and, and the union is going to be C1, C2, C3, C4, and this is going to be equal to two points. So you would always assume then in clustering that your clusters are a similar size? Uh, no. You don't have to make any assumptions on it. So because if you were to add a fifth cluster that's, that's 10 to 50, that you know only if it's only is in set B, then suddenly the, the similarity is actually wildly off. But by clustering, we don't see that, right? Right. So, well, you have to choose your clusters wisely. If you if you if you choose them so that most of the elements on both sets end up in one cluster, uh, then then maybe this is a bad thing. But maybe uh, this is maybe this turns out to be a good thing. Maybe those sorts of elements don't matter so much, or they all represent the same the same thing. 
right? So, so let's say that I was, um, you know, um, I, I was, I, I was clustering people in the class of which, uh, um, by which continent, uh, um, by which continent they were born in, right? So I want to see um, um, how large is the diversity of the class. Probably a large number are from, from North America. Maybe less so in this class than maybe some of the maybe the intro CS class, but there are more international students here. Uh, so there, there are more students here from, from Asia um, and maybe from Europe. You know, I don't know. So, um, but but I'm representing the diversity of the class. So the cluster, just because they're not weighted equally, it may still tell me something interesting, different than just um, than just the sets. Right, and and we'll we'll see examples with with when we get back to text processing of how this variation can also be uh, useful in ways. And you know, it's it's really it's really the same thing. Instead of just saying individual elements, you're just saying I'm I'm mapping some feature of the elements, and the feature is it belongs in cluster one, right? So the feature of element one is is value one, right? So I'm, I'm it's just just a mapping. Um, okay, so okay, so so here's you know the basic Jacquard similarity and some some other variation of it. So how do we apply this to text? So yeah, vocabulary. What vocabulary? Uh, vocabulary. Well, uh, what does that mean? About a ring of ring of text. We we got the set of the words and the the, the similarities. So I yeah. can say, I mean, there's a lot of natural language processing techniques out there, like engrams and determining the kind of structure of the data depending on the language. Yeah. So, so there's a lots of issues with <laughs> with natural language processing that I'll mention a little bit later. But we're going to start with things that are more simple, and then we'll get into more issues in, in modeling. This the simplest is the bag of Uh, on this model called uh, the bag of words, where you just look at which words are in each each document, and and typically you're going to um, you know um, this is going to be a multi um, set, so it's going to be the set of the words and also the counts of how many times the word occurs. Um, so this is one approach, and. This will also be simple to apply, but we'll talk about something that gives a little bit more structure called n-grams, um, and the, these are also called um, n-shingles. Um, actually, I'm going to use k, just because I like k better, but... Um, call an n-gram a k-gram? Ridiculous. That's my personal preference. I'm teaching, I can do what I want. <laughs> Yeah, if you're teaching a class, you can call them engrams. <laughs> <laughs> My NLP literature is highly obsessed. Yeah, yeah. So, well, if you look in the, I, I'm calling them k-grams. I, or I, I'm calling, them, I'll call them k-shingles because the MMDS book, which is the, 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 the book we're following closest, calls them shingles. And I think they use k, but I could be wrong. Um, so, but think of k as a, as a number so um, so and and it's, these are going to be over um, or items which could be um, either the words or even um, just the characters um, okay so 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 to explain this I'm going to go through I'm going to go through an example on uh, this part of the board I guess so um, um, I Sam uh, uh, should know this. Okay. I do not like ring and I do. So, 
of people have seen this before. And if, if not, it's, it'll work well for our, our example. Um, so, so think of this as a, as a think of this as a document. Um, and this, so to create the K shingles with, with words, um, it's basically, if, if you have a one shingle, you're looking at every, uh, um, every individual word which appears in the text. Right, so you're just looking at all the words which appear in the document. So the, use this as our example. So the, um, the one um, shingle is, is, the, is, is going to be the set I, so it's a set, so I am Sam, and I see Sam, if I'm processing this, I see Sam, I've already seen this before, um, I've already seen I, I've already seen am, I've already seen I, and then do not like green eggs and ham, uh, and then I do not like them, uh, and then Sam I am is old. Okay, good. Just enough for me. Okay, so these are all the one shingles, right? The, um, the two shingles are every consecutive set of two words in a row. Right, so the first one is I am. The next one is am Sam. Then Sam Sam. Then Sam I. Now I am, I've got in the set already. Am I, I I don't have the set, right? Yeah. Am I? Um, let's see here. I, I, I do do <coughs> not not like like green. <coughs> 